Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Paleocrat Diaries. I'm Jake Fowler. I'll be your host for the Ecumenical Council's Part 20. I can't believe it. Well, I can believe it because I did it. Part 20. And this will be the penultimate for this first segment. By the time we're done with Part 21, next week presumably, we will have looked at eight of the 21 ecumenical councils of the one holy catholic and apostolic church the roman church as it were my goodness i've shifted my days i was posting on tuesdays and then sometimes thursdays and now it's saturday i'm all over the map don't worry i'll get my act together one of these days in the meantime bear with me pour yourself a drink here we go no pleasantries today just straight into it Hmm. Music down, there we go. Outline, check. All right, well, maybe maybe one pleasant tree. Um, if you would like to support my wife's business, you can do that. Etsy.com, search Our Lady's Closet. She makes really beautiful Catholic dresses for girls. All right, here we go. I left you, and we were in about the year 843. The wild and crazy ride that was the iconoclast heresy has now come to an end and we're looking at another wild and crazy ride although it didn't have the makings of that right away well it was sort of bubbling under the surface but things didn't really come out until the 850s saint methodius the patriarch of constantinople who was installed by empress theodora remember she's the empress mother she's the regent for Michael III. She puts him on the patriarchal throne in 843. He didn't last very long. He evidently was, I mean, he was fairly old. He died in 846, and early the following year, he's replaced by a man named Ignatius. Ignatius, this is the same fella I mentioned before. He's the youngest son of Emperor Michael I. His name back then was Niketas, and he was castrated and sent away into a monastery where he learned very much, and he became quite an able churchman, very capable administrator, strongly orthodox. And as the new patriarch of Constantinople, he did not want to have anything to do with those who had previously acquiesced to iconoclasm. He was, uh, what you might say, rigid, tongue-in-cheek, of course. He was on the right side of things. But Ignatius did not want to reconcile with those whom he perceived as having betrayed the faith during the iconoclast controversy. Because of that, he found himself opposed, or at loggerheads, you might say, with a certain bishop from Syracuse, Gregory Asbestos. <clears throat> Excuse me. Syracuse is in Sicily. That's the, an island off of mainland Italy, and that would normally be the jurisdiction of Rome. But recall, over a century prior, Emperor Leo III, the Asaurian, although not from Asauria, had removed it from papal jurisdiction, and he had given it to the see of Constantinople. He did that with Sicily, Calabria, and Illyricum. That uh, unlawful, uncanonical act was still playing itself out, despite the repeated attempts of the popes to retrieve their territory, their ecclesiastical territory, right, their jurisdiction. It rightfully belonged to Rome. But it was given to Constantinople, and so Ignatius now, patriarch in Constantinople, is butting heads with this Gregory, who's a bishop uh, in Syracuse, because Gregory's more moderate, and Ignatius is more hardline with respect to the iconoclasts who want to reconcile. So again, Ignatius says, you know, I'm not really interested in bringing you guys back into communion because of the way you behaved these last several decades. And Gregory takes a different approach, and so the two of them butt heads. Ignatius now was a man of little fear. 
And this will come back to bite him eventually. He didn't mind running afoul even of the imperial family if he believed it to be necessary. Now, as I mentioned previously, during the final days of iconoclasm, the empire was in the hands of the empress mother, Theodora. She was the regent for Michael III. When he came of age, when Michael III came of age, and this would have been about the mid-850s. Remember, he was two when his father died and Theodora took over, basically. So that was in 842. This young man was born around 840. So in the mid-850s, he's 15, 16 years old, and he's feeling the desire now to be free from his mother and take the empire that his father left to him. Her influence naturally waned, but her brother, a man named Bardas, his influence increased. This is Michael III's uncle. Bardas was, according to Monsignor Philip Hughes, uh, quote, a man of great ability, cultivated, but a loose liver. Michael III has this man, Bardas, proclaimed Caesar, which basically meant that Bardas could run the show while Michael was out living it up. Bardas had virtually free reign to do whatever he wanted to do in the government. And I'm not trying to say that he was incapable. Apparently he was quite capable. But Bardas wasn't exactly the most moral person either. And nor was Michael III. As a matter of fact, uh, he's known to history as Michael the Drunkard. This is how you get a name like that. You turn 16, you basically hand over your empire to your uncle, and you go out carousing with your friends and whichever ladies care to join you pretty much every day. Now, remember Ignatius. He's a eunuch, right? He was, he was castrated, so he's not able to enjoy any of the sensual pleasures that Michael III and Bardas are able to partake in. And he's been in a monastery for a long time. He's been formed as a very solid ascetic, ascetic. And he's a good leader. He's a solid patriarch. He becomes engaged in a dispute uh, between the monks of the Studite Monastery and the supporters of the repentant iconoclasts. Remember, this is what got him into hot water or, or what brought him into tension with this Gregory Asbestos from Syracuse. Naturally, being the more hardliner that he was, he sided with the Studites. They were more rigorous. He naturally identifies with them, right? This dispute eventually leads to Ignatius deposing Gregory Asbestos. He's no longer Archbishop of Syracuse. You're out. This was, again, only possible. I mean, Constantinople deposing an Italian bishop because of Leo III's actions in the 700s. Now, Rome rejected this. The Pope at the time, he says, look, this is not the way this works. That's my territory, not your jurisdiction. You can't just come in here and depose bishops without a trial, without a hearing, and the hearing has to be done here in Rome because canonically this is our jurisdiction. Leo III erred when he stole it, basically, and gave it to Constantinople. And you guys want to act, you guys being Ignatius, as if this was just fine and now you have custody over Sicily, Calabria, and Illyricum. It's not going to fly. So Rome rejects this. To add to the matter, to add, add a complexity, a complication, if you will, Uncle Bardas had given up his lawful wife and had started an affair with his daughter-in-law. Now, it's pretty bad already, not as bad as it sounds. I should have said first, his son had died. So his daughter-in-law was a widow. So it's not as bad as it could have been, 
but it's still pretty gross and definitely against the moral law and definitely against canon law. And Ignatius knows this, and he's not afraid, again, to run afoul of Imperials when he feels he has to. He's never accused of being timid, and he publicly denounces this state of affairs. Obviously, this angers Bardas, and it angers Michael III. This is putting Ignatius on the wrong side of people who, A, have lax morals, as is evident by their behavior, and B, have the power to kill him. The situation persists. That occurred in 856, two years later, or about two years later, 858 on Epiphany. Bardas is attending a divine liturgy. He presents himself for Holy Communion, like certain other American politicians who may or may not be in an irregular status. Hmm. He presents himself for Holy Communion, and Ignatius refuses publicly. He's in Hagia Sophia on Epiphany, and he's denied communion. Again, this angers Michael III. This angers Bardas. They won't stand for it. First, you're going to call me out for my illicit relationship with my daughter-in-law. Now you're going to publicly refuse me Holy Communion. Don't you know I'm the Caesar of this empire? Don't you know I'm the emperor's uncle? That he entrusts the running of this government to me? can only imagine the things going through Bardas's head at that time. Later that same year, so 858, Bardas and Uncle, uh, Michael excuse me, are getting really tired of Theodora, Michael's mother. She still must have some sort of influence in the court. If she were totally insignificant, they wouldn't do what they're about to do. So she must have had some sway, some power still left, maybe some influence with some people, right? Bardas and Michael III hatch a plan. They're going to ship her off to a convent, and they're going to make it sound like she had discovered late in life a vocation. She's going to be a nun, and everything is going to be great. But in order to accomplish this, they knew they needed Ignatius. So here's a man, Ignatius, who's gone against them twice, whose help they now need. So Bardas and Michael go to Ignatius. They must have explained their plan somehow. Hey, you know, I think Theodora, my mom, yeah, she's been praying a lot lately, and she's just been really, really excited about going to live by herself to never be heard from again in this monastery. What do you say, Ignatius? Can you help us out? Can we get her out of here so that Bardas and I can do what we want to do with no influence? Hmm. Ignatius is not going for this. That's strike three. He was unwilling to shame the empress in such a way. And besides, he doesn't get along with Bardas. So any reason to <laughs> thwart his plan is probably seen as a pretty welcome opportunity. Well, this is the last straw. Bardas and Michael III have had enough, and they deposed him right away. This was November the 23rd, 858. Ignatius is exiled to a nearby island. There's some islands in the uh, Sea of Marmara, which is the sea. So Constantinople sits in kind of a unique spot in the world. It's on the Bosporus Strait, which is between the Black Sea and the Sea of Marmara. The Sea of Marmara is connected to the Mediterranean through a tiny little, it's a narrow little channel called the Dardanelles. And... The Sea of Marmara has these islands just south of the capital city, and one of them is called Terabintos, which I think means something like Island of the Oaks. Maybe there were trees there. Uh, Ignatius is sent there for exile. Now, I have to imagine, at that latitude and longitude, on an island pretty much in the Mediterranean, where you can pretty well see Constantinople from where you're at. I mean, supply ships are going back and forth. 
I don't know that that exile was very difficult. I could be wrong. I'm told, well, I've read, that he was mistreated, right? Maybe it was a rough life for him once he reached the island. Perhaps. Perhaps so. But still, I think there are probably worse places to be exiled. Now, Ignatius, upon his deposition, the sources conflict on this. He was either forced to resign, right, forced to sign some sort of uh, declaration, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm turning over my, my patriarchal throne because whatever the reason that they would have given, or he was forced, uh, intentionally deposed, I should say. Well, he was intentionally deposed. Let me get my thoughts together here. Hang on, more bourbon. Mm. There we go. Either Ignatius was forced to sign a resignation, legitimizing his deposition, or he actually did want to give in because he saw the writing on the wall. He saw, look, they kicked me out. They sent me to this island. I got soldiers all around. I'm not coming back. Might as well just resign. Heck with it. I'll go back to being a monk. So it's either a forced resignation or a willful resignation under these extremely difficult circumstances. Thank you, Bourbon. Okay. At least now, there's the appearance of legitimate succession, right? But the people, they need a patriarch. Finding a successor to Ignatius is not going to prove to be an easy task. Ignatius was very powerful, very influential, very well known. He had a lot of friends. And a lot of people probably saw through this um, resignation situation in the first place. So Bardas and Michael III need a really swell candidate to take his place. And they find a man named Photius. Photius was an extremely intelligent man. He was a professor of philosophy at the university in Constantinople. He's a relative of some pretty high-ranking former clerics, most notably the patriarch Tarasius. Recall, Tarasius was patriarch beginning in, I believe, 786, appointed so by Empress Irene. He was the one that she tasked to work with Pope Hadrian I on the Seventh Ecumenical Council, Nicaea II. Tarasius was a layman. Photius is a layman. They're related. Photius's family, which is Tarasius's family, they had long suffered as iconodules. All throughout the iconoclast controversy, the persecution that came from that, the family went through a ton. And so they had a good reputation among the people of Constantinople. They were strong defenders of images. And again, this Photius, he's extremely intelligent. He's well-liked. He's of noble birth. Translator of several books and so on. I mean, I could go on. His scholarship was so well-known at the time. He remains, in fact, to this day, one of the most learned men ever. If we had to make a list, he would be on that list. He'd be up there with Aquinas and Aristotle. I mean, he was just simply brilliant. Brilliance doesn't necessarily equal orthodoxy, as we will see. Now, at this time in 858, Photius seems like a perfect candidate, except, as I mentioned, he's a layman. He's not in any sort of holy orders. Well, that never stopped a Byzantine emperor before. He was a government employee. I mentioned he was a professor of philosophy at the university. He was known to Michael III. He was known to Bardas to be reliable. And so they ran him through in December of 858. Very quickly, I might add, within, I think, five days from December 20th to Christmas Day, they ran him through all of the minor orders, the diaconate, the priesthood, and then they came to consecrate him a bishop, and they looked around and they thought, 
who in the world is going to consecrate this guy a bishop? A lot of people still side with Ignatius. A number of bishops loyal to him refused to do it. Aha! But they found one guy. Gregory Asbestos, the deposed-ish Archbishop of Syracuse. Not deposed according to the West, deposed according to the East, but again, Bardas and Michael III, they're like, look, we need Photius. Gregory, you're ordained, right? Okay, so you can do it. It'd be valid. Go ahead and do it. Photius is going to be our man. He was consecrated by Gregory on Christmas Day, 858. Almost immediately after the fact, the emperor and the Caesar initiate a campaign to persuade the bishops that Photius is the candidate to back. Now, we have the Ignatian party, we have a Photian party. There were these groups that were forming around each guy. Each one wanted to recognize whom they thought was the rightful lawful patriarch of Constantinople. The Ignatian party, the bishops who sided with Ignatius, they held a synod not long after his consecration. They decided that his election was null, and they excommunicated him. Now, I'm not certain who these bishops were, but Photius is instantly out of communion with a bunch of guys. But he doesn't let that get him down, you know. Early the next year in 859, he holds a synod of his own in Constantinople, and he brings together his supporters, those who thought he ought to be patriarch instead of Ignatius. Ignatius and the bishops who supported him are deposed at Photius's synod. So now you have two rival camps. You have the Ignatians, you have the Photians. The Photians are backed by the government. Guess what happens to the Ignatians? They get to see what the inside of prisons look like. Free of charge. They get to stay as long as they want, as long as they don't want. Some of them were even so lucky. They didn't have to pay for this service at all. It was a free service offered by the government. Torture. To cement his new position, Photius and Michael III each sent letters to Rome. They wrote to the Pope. The Pope at this time is a man named Nicholas. Nicholas has been Pope since 858. This is Nicholas I, and we call him Saint Nicholas the Great. Nicholas did not wish to weigh in on the matter until he had more information. But Ignatius hadn't sent anything to Rome. So the Pope instead sends two legates to Constantinople. Two Italian bishops are chosen. They're dispatched to gather information and to report back. Let me repeat that. Gather information and report back. These bishops were Rodoald of Porto and Zachary of Agnani. I think I'm saying that right. I don't speak Italian. Close enough. When these legates arrived, these two Italian bishops, Photius saw an opportunity. Hmm. What can you do in Constantinople when you see some Roman legates heading your way? Well, You can hold a council, and you can claim it's ecumenical. So he holds another synod. This is in the spring of 861. The legates with the synod turn their attention almost immediately to Ignatius. What was this business with Gregory Asbestos, they wonder? Were you even lawfully elected in the first place? Hmm. Ignatius, for his part, he recognized the overreach. He declares to the legates, quote, I cannot be judged by you because you were not sent here to judge me. Remember, he's correct. Nicholas sent them to gather information and to report back. 
But, in the end, Ignatius is again declared deposed, and Photius is declared to be his lawful successor on the patriarchal throne of Constantinople. What a mess. And this is in the spring of 861. For some reason, I read about it. I forgot what I read. <laughs> it took them a long time to get home. In 862, the legates are finally back. So, I mean, this is a several-month journey. And in March, there was a synod in Rome in which Nicholas and the legates and the bishops of that area met and they wanted to know like well what happened we sent you to gather all this information and to report back what did you guys do and they said oh yeah about that um we kind of had like a council last spring yeah we sort of deposed ignatius and we confirmed photius as the patriarch that's good right nicholas is not happy the folly of the legates is revealed to the bishops. And they were, uh, they, the legates, that's Rodewald and Zachary, they were summarily disciplined, relieved of their posts, I believe. The proceedings of this synod of 861 were declared null and void. Ignatius was declared to be the rightful patriarch of Constantinople until the case against him could be heard by Rome. So stop trying to decide it on your own. Don't hold a synod. No, we hold a synod. No, you're going to hold another synod. No, we held another synod. Knock it off. Bring it to Papa. Bring it to Rome. And until that time, the guy who held the throne last, he's the lawful patriarch. That's what Nicholas I and the Roman Synod of 862 said. Now, Two and a half years later, give or take, Ignatius finally sends word to Nicholas requesting assistance. Better late than never, I guess. In his appeal to the Pope, Ignatius includes details that may have been left out by Photius and Michael III when they initially sent their letters. Ignatius relates the story of Bardas's affair with his daughter-in-law, which Ignatius corrected, or attempted to correct. Ignatius relates the tale of refusing Bardas' holy communion for his persistent state of mortal sin, public scandal. And finally, the attempt to ship the empress mother Theodora off to a convent against her will. All these things come before the Pope's attention, and Nicholas I is now determined to hold another synod. The following spring, so April 863, the bishops once more gathered in Rome to hear the matter. The facts were presented as they were now known. Ignatius is declared to be the lawful patriarch of Constantinople again, Photius is declared deposed again, and this time excommunicated. And indeed, in addition to him, all those whom Photius had ordained or consecrated in his about five years as patriarch, they're excommunicated also. That's got to be a lot of people. That's got to be a lot of people. I don't have a number in front of me, but I can imagine it's more than a few. The legates that took part in the Phocian Synod of 861 and Gregory Asbestos, they suffered the same fate. Deposed, excommunicated. So, Gregory, you're out for real this time. Uh, Rodewald, goodbye. And Zachary, sorry, buddy. When the proceedings of this Roman Synod of 863 were made known to the East, we're not entirely sure what was said. No reply has survived the sands of time. 
The next installment, if you will, in this drama is a scathing letter from Nicholas I to Emperor Michael, Emperor Michael III. He rebukes the emperor for his, quote, blasphemous letter. So although we don't have the reply from Michael III, it seems as if he wrote something pretty irreverent. He wasn't treating the Holy Father in the way the Holy Father ought to be treated. And Nicholas recognizes this, and he corrects his subject. He demands that the papal decisions executed at the Roman Synod of 863 are accepted and enforced. And again, no reply is known from the East. In 866, Nicholas fires off another fiery letter. Now, things obviously are heating up. Photius can't just sit back and say nothing. It will make it look like Nicholas is correct if you never have anything to say in your own defense. So Photius, in order to justify his continued split with Rome, remember, the Pope deposed and excommunicated him in 863. Three years later, we finally hear from him. In fact, I think it's actually four years later, 867, when this letter that I'm about to tell you about is sent to the Pope. He makes, uh, he, Photius, makes a series of charges against Nicholas I and indeed almost all of the West. He says the following. Latins fast on Saturdays. Latins eat dairy and eggs the first week of Lent. Married clergy are not allowed. And the filioque. Hmm. I will tease the first three a little bit. I will not tease the filioque. That is a significant doctrinal dispute. The other three are just customs. That's just the difference between how Christianity is practiced in the East and how it's practiced in the West. Let's go over them again. The Latins fast on Saturdays. Okay. Sunday is the Sabbath. The East, they, uh, they don't fast on Saturday in honor of the original Sabbath that God ordained on Saturday. Okay, great. Great. You do that, and we'll do the other. No problem. It's just a matter of custom. Latins eat dairy and eggs the first week of Lent. First of all, that's false. The first week of Lent according to the Eastern calculation, but in the West, we calculate it differently. Eastern Lent begins on what's known as Clean Monday, which is the seventh Monday before Easter. And so Monday and Tuesday of that week uh, are part of Lent, if you're in the East. But Western Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, the seventh Wednesday before Easter. So the Monday and Tuesday preceding that are not a part of Lent. Hence, Shrove Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras. Go ahead and eat that cheese. Drink the milk. It's okay. So those two complaints, that's Photius should have known better. Married clergy were not allowed. That was the third one I mentioned. Hmm. Well, this was a development. You see, uh, and I'm going off of my memory here. I'm kind of going a little off script, so forgive me if it's a little, well, not as precise. Married clergy had been allowed, but they were expected to be continent after their ordination. Because that was really, really difficult for married couples to do, eventually the discipline in the West became such that, you know, we're not going to ordain married men anymore. It's fine in theory, but we're not going to do it in practice. But in the East, they said, well, we're not going to enforce continence anymore. It's fine in theory, but we're not going to do it in practice. And so these two different customs grew. 
and they grew in different directions. And so if you're only immersed in the one or you're only immersed in the other, you might think the opposite one is committing a sin or at the very least is, is wrong. But that's not the case. These are just different customs. Now, back to the filioque, and I want to preface my, the, the following remarks by saying this. This is not an episode dedicated strictly to theology. In fact, we've been doing mostly history. We do theology when we have to, right? I'm not averse to it, but this is a tale of the councils from the lens of history. It's not a, a theological treatise, okay, video form. So very briefly, and I, again, I know this does not adequately treat the subject. That is not my intention. Very briefly, filioque is Latin for and the son. The Greeks, the Eastern uh, Christians, they profess that the son is generated and that the spirit proceeds from the father. They profess that the profess that the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. Right? There's a passage in scriptures, uh, there's at least two, I believe, where Christ himself speaks about sending the Holy Spirit. So you can't deny that. But the Greeks say, well, he, he the Holy Spirit, proceeds from the Father through the Son. He doesn't proceed from the Son. Okay. They don't say this in the creed explicitly. They simply profess procession from the Father. The Latins in the West, they say proceeds from the Father, and they also say proceeds from the Son. Now, they confined the terms begotten or generated only to the Son, the second person of the Trinity. So when they say the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, filioque, that's not meant to be anything other than what the Greeks are saying. From the Father through the Son. He comes from the Father and the Son, right? Yeah. The Father and the Son sent him, right? Yeah. Okay, what's the problem? Well, the problem really was that the Latins, at least some of them, had added it to the Nicene Creed. Hmm. Photius, in his letter in 867, in addition to the three customs that I previously described, he says, Nicholas, you are a heretic because of this filioque in the creed. In his mind, the decisions of the Pope, therefore, could be ignored. Hmm. Not only could be, but should be. So, Photius judges the Pope to be a heretic, and he says, therefore, I don't have to honor, I don't have to obey, I don't have to give any credence to his canonical decisions about my status as patriarch, Ignatius's status as patriarch. Hmm. Interesting. Photius recognized Nicholas as a successor of Peter, but resisted his will, resisted Nicholas's manifest mind on the matter. Photius summons a council in the summer of 867, wherein the Pope is declared to be deposed. Nicholas I and anyone who supports him were called, quote, forerunners of apostasy, servants of the Antichrist, liars, and fighters against God. Letters were sent to Rome informing them of their new status as forerunners of apostasy, liars, and so on and so on. Now, I've mentioned it before that it wasn't as if the Great Schism right, nominally associated with the year 1054, it wasn't as if this just came out of nowhere. Once more, we can point to something 
a big something in this case, and say, you know, this is surely a factor in the rift between the churches we now refer to as Catholic and Orthodox. Those terms would have been interchangeable referring to the body of Christ prior to 1054. Now they're unique, if you will, right? The Orthodox Church claims Catholicity small c. The Catholic Church claims Orthodoxy small o. It's confusing. <clears throat> now, while all of this is going on, there are some external developments that I feel obligated to tell you about. The conflict between Rome and Constantinople gains an added layer of depth when we consider the Bulgarians. The Bulgarian mission territory. Boris, who was king of the Bulgarians in the 860s, he had determined to convert to Christianity. He made up his mind. He'd heard the message of Christ somehow. And he says, you know what? I want that. And not only do I want that, I want that for all of my people. So we need some missionaries and we need some bishops. Can, let's go. Let's do this. Boris himself was baptized in 864. And he took the Christian name of Michael after his baptismal sponsor, Emperor Michael III. Like I said, Boris wanted some priests. He wants some bishops. He wants missionaries to evangelize his people. But Photius refused him bishops. He says, well, I'll send you some priests. I might be able to spare a few monks, but I'm not sending you bishops. You're brand new converts. Why would I send you bishops? You can just be under the see of Constantinople. As a side note, is it wise to anger the king who is the successor of the guy who turned the Roman emperor's head into a goblet? I'm not sure about that. Boris becomes frustrated with Constantinople. He doesn't cut anybody's heads off, at least that I'm aware of. But instead, he turns to Rome. He requests bishops from Rome. He wants to be Roman Catholic instead of Greek Catholic. Nicholas says, sure, we'll send you some bishops. One of whom, Formosus, was destined to become a pope uh, in his own future. In fact, Formosus was the bishop who replaced one of those deposed legates from the Synod of Constantinople in 861, Rodoald. Rodoald of Porto, you're out. Remember, he was deposed in 863. And Formosus assumes that C. So he's Bishop of Porto. He's on mission in Bulgaria. And there was another bishop also. So here we have a war of sorts over mission territory. The Greeks cl uh, claimed the right to evangelize Bulgaria. But the Latins had fulfilled the desire of the Bulgarians that the East were unwilly, unwilling to do. So Bulgarian territory. Well, if you look at where Bulgaria is on the map, it's kind of like Illyricum. And that was traditionally the jurisdiction of the West. And Boris is more keen on the Latins now because Photius failed to oblige him his request. But he's nobody's fool. In fact, he's a very shrewd king. Wise. He sees the writing on the wall. He sees, you know, maybe I can play these guys off of each other. Maybe I and my people, the Bulgarians, can get a really sweet deal out of the matter. Hmm. So he asks Rome for a patriarch. But Nicholas is unwilling to do that. Now, there were some imperial developments. So we've got 
Ignatius versus Photius. We've got Photius versus Nicholas. We've got Boris pitting Photius and Nicholas against one another through him regarding the missionary work in Bulgaria. And in the midst of all of this, in the imperial household, trouble is brewing. Bardas, the uncle to Michael III, and the Caesar, again, practically running the empire, he's fallen out of favor with Michael III. You see, it wasn't really anything he did wrong. It's just that Michael found a new friend, Basil. Basil was uh, perhaps an Armenian. He's known as Basil the Macedonian. He's a strong man, right? Uh, a circus performer of sorts. And he's got a lot of athleticism. And apparently he's a heck of a drinking buddy too. He was completely illiterate, but man, could that guy hold his liquor. And he became really close with Emperor Michael III. In the year 866, Basil persuades Michael that Bardas needs to go. In April, Basil arranged to have Bardas murdered. Basil then assumes the vacancy created by this power vacuum. Well, Michael III, now that your uncle is tragically met his end. I don't know how that happened. Don't you need a new Caesar? Wouldn't you like it to be me? Right away, Basil and Photius, they're not going to get along very well. Basil had killed the man who made Photius what he was. And Basil was very heavily influencing Michael III. This tension carries over into 867. Remember, this is the year that Photius decides to write that snarky letter to Rome, talking about the fast, talking about the married clergy, talking about cheese on Monday and Tuesday before Ash Wednesday. Basil seems to... Uh, he was illiterate, yes, but... He must have sensed something. He must have thought, you know, what I did to Bardas could easily be done to me. And in order to prevent that, there's only really one thing that has to be done. Maybe Michael III is getting tired of me. I don't want to end up like Uncle Bardas. So Basil perhaps by his own hand, slew Michael III, September 23rd of 867. Basil killed the emperor, killed him in cold blood, and he had himself proclaimed Roman emperor, Basil I. This is the inauguration of the Macedonian dynasty, which, I might add, was the dynasty the most successful one that I'm aware of for the Byzantines, reigned from 867 to, I think, 1071, something like that. Pretty healthy span of time. Lots of great things going on in Byzantium during that time. We'll get to that eventually. But now that Michael III is out of the picture and Basil I is the emperor, it's time for a clean house, right? Out with the old, in with the new administration. You know, this is like the transition time. Every time we have a new president, all of your cabinet officials have to go. I'm going to bring in my own guys. And this includes Photius. Photius didn't ever get along well with Basil anyway. So it really wasn't that hard for Basil to say, hey, sorry, pal, you got to go. Basil recalls Ignatius from exile and reinstated him as the Patriarch of Constantinople. And then he sends word to the Pope of the events, and he suggests that, you know, maybe the divide between the Ignatians and the Photians could be decided by you so that there can be closure and peace can reign once more in the Church 
and in the empire. Funny thing, Photius's letter decrying the Pope as a heretic directed at Nicholas I, and Basil's letter addressed to the same Pope saying, you know, hey, let's try to figure this thing out. I want to reconcile. When Nicholas was dead, the letters are received by Hadrian II. Hadrian is a strong Pope, but he's not Nicholas the Great. Basil proposes a council to end the schism between Constantinople and Rome, a schism we now refer to as the Photian Schism. Photius, uh, excuse me, let me back up a little bit. Hadrian II is amenable to a council. He says, you know, Emperor Basil I, the Macedonian, former circus strongman, illiterate though you are, not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. We can have a council as long as you do what I say. This is kind of like the way Agatho did it, the way Leo the Great did it, the way Hadrian I did it. You know, yeah, I guess we can have a council, but here's what's going to happen at this council. This is what we're going to do, and you're either okay with it or you're not. Here are the conditions. Photius is to be condemned and excommunicated again. And if he repents, he can come back into communion with the church, but he can never be more than a layman ever again. Number two, anyone whom Photius ordained or consecrated was excommunicated. But if they repent, they can come back into communion with the church, but only as laymen. Number three, the Council of 867 is to be condemned. That's the Photian Council of 867, the one that deposed Nicholas I. It's to be condemned and annulled, and the new council in Constantinople was to be ordered to accept these decisions, these three decisions, to condemn and excommunicate Photius, condemn and excommunicate anyone whom he ordained or consecrated, and annul Photius's council or synod of 867 in Constantinople. There are the terms. Do not discuss it. Do not resist. This is what you're going to do, right? So says Hadrian II to Basil I. I think we ought to stop there. Let me switch to the end screen. I like this screen. I like this song. It's in my ear right here. I like this drink. Okay, so we've covered, not as long, but my goodness, what a crazy two decades were the 850s and 860s. We're not even out of them yet. We're sitting in about the year 869. Or we will be. Next time, and next time will be the last time for this segment of the Ecumenical Councils, we are going to look at Constantinople IV, which the West holds as the eighth ecumenical. The East does not recognize. We're going to look at Constantinople IV, and then the aftermath, and then on to other things for a short time. I know I need time to do research. This, these things don't just pop into my mind as much as I'd like to believe that they do sometimes. But we'll come back to it, so have no fear. Have no fear, and also, never give up. Keep on smiling, and memento mori.